Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, first, I want to say um, thanks to everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story today that we published um, in autumn last year. And uh, I'm going to tell you about essentially how the early embryo makes heterochromatin and specifically how does it silence transposable elements. So for some background, um, I'm sure kind of doesn't really need much introduction, but transposable elements are selfish genetic parasites that are able to copy and paste themselves within the genomes of their hosts and in doing so have been um, extremely successful, particularly in eukaryotes where they generally make up between five and 90% of uh, their host genome. And that's certainly the case in animals. So because of, uh, you know, this success, they've had also an awful lot of deleterious effects. And so this ranges from things like insertional mutagenesis to genome instability and so on. And as a result, eukaryotes and animals, again, no exception, um, package these transposable elements and indeed other repetitive DNAs into transcriptionally silent heterochromatin. So... The kind of big question that I'm going to be talking about today is essentially how do animals target heterochromatin to transposable elements? How do they know what's sort of self and not self? And this is particularly important in the context of early embryogenesis because transposable elements during this time period have this uh, brief window in which they can jump in pluripotent stem cells and jumping in these cells gives them um, a much higher chance of being inherited by the germline and therefore successive generations. So in mammals, uh, humans, uh, mice, um, certainly ourselves, we have uh, essentially this big system of crab zinc finger proteins. So we have about 400 crab zinc fingers and this varies you know, between species. So crab zinc fingers essentially recruit all this heterochromatin inducing machinery and they do this by this crab box but then the sort of business end of crab zinc fingers proteins are the zinc finger arrays so zinc fingers are these sort of short protein motifs that are capable of binding roughly three nucleic acids but if you arrange these in tandem in different combinations you can target sort of arbitrarily complex sequences and from sort of over a decade of uh, research now, we know that crab zinc fingers specifically target transposable elements. Um, by and large, uh, transposable elements, sometimes um, satellite repeats, other kind of simple repeats and so on. And they do this uh, in this big wave early in embryogenesis. So they're some of the very first genes to be turned on. And they need to do this because you have this kind of wave of epigenetic reprogramming and uh, therefore this, this need to quickly re-establish heterochromatin over the genome. And uh, just a quick point that's going to come up later is the sort of first um, big piece of evidence that really kind of got people thinking about crab zinc fingers and a role in TE silencing was this finding that the number of crab zinc fingers um, correlates very strongly with the number of TEs. So the more TEs you have, the more crab zinc finger genes. All right, so the issue with this, when I first read this paper, I thought it was amazing, but, you know, I'm kind of really interested in, uh, you know, a much wider range of animals, and crab zinc fingers are limited to tetrapods. So on this tree here, we're looking at some 30,000 species here, and potentially millions of other um, metazoan species out there. And one of the kind of hallmark features of metazoans really is that they've had this enormous expansion in the kind of complexity and size of the zinc finger sort of super family. And so I wanted to know, are other metazoan zinc finger proteins involved in silencing transposable elements? And um, so again, like crab zinc fingers are just one sort of small family amongst a much larger super family. So to tackle this, the first thing I did is start annotating zinc fingers in the kind of thousands of genome assemblies that we have available to us now. So on the x-axis here, we're looking at the number of zinc finger open reading frames and on the y-axis, just different um, taxonomic groups. And so we can see that in most metazones, you've typically got hundreds of these crab zinc finger genes and often thousands. 
So revisiting that kind of first uh, experiment that kind of hinted that there's this um, relationship between zinc fingers and uh, transposable elements, uh, I just wanted to again ask, what's the correlation between the number of transposable elements on the x-axis and zinc fingers on the y? And um, sure enough, there is a strong correlation. Uh, so this is not now just crab zinc fingers, but this is all zinc fingers across all metazoans. And this holds true in whatever taxonomic group you look at, so chordates, arthropods, and so on. And this was all work done by uh, Caitlin Coleman, who's a uh, fantastic undergrad and now PhD student. Okay, so we know now crabs and fingers and TEs are co-evolving. Um, we've got a lot of additional evidence um, supporting this that um, you know I don't have time to show you, but I also don't need to tell you guys that correlation is not the same as causation. And so we wanted to then try and explicitly show um, are there other zinc finger subfamilies in the kind of metazoan tree that silence transposable elements during embryogenesis? So to answer this, we turn to this um, kind of fairly newly discovered family, the fin zinc fingers. So these are found in supriniform fish, where the copy number ranges from uh, anywhere from around 10 to 700. So this is very typical of metazoans. And if you look at the typical gene structure of these, it consists of this array of zinc fingers. And then upstream of that, we have this novel domain of unknown function, which we've dubbed this uh, fins domain. And the one kind of clue that this is doing something important uh, related to heterochromatin is that it has these conserved little motifs here that we know are strongly associated with transcriptional repression and especially um, transcriptional repression through heterochromatin. So um, we took this big effort to re-annotate all of these genes in zebrafish and found a lot more than uh, in previous annotations and then wanted to ask, when are these genes actually expressed? And we find that using this uh, amazing data set from um, White et al, um, there we look at a time course of the zinc finger gene expression from the fertilized zygote at this stage all the way to uh, day five. We see that zinc fingers, each one of these lines here is a separate zinc finger. Uh, zinc fingers are expressed in this big burst in embryonic development. So this kind of gray bar here is essentially the um, timing of zygotic genome activation. So these are really some of the very first genes to be expressed. And more than that, the expression correlates very strongly with the expression of transposable elements in those same embryos. So this gives us a big clue again that these um, fin zinc fingers really are doing something related to these transposable elements. But to test this explicitly through a functional genetics approach, we, uh, with the help of Sylvia Chang, uh, designed this um, morpholino-based experiment where we were able to leverage the fact that these genes are so rapidly duplicating and are so similar to one another that with a single morpholino, we're able to knock down more than 400 of these zinc finger genes at once. So what we did is we take this um, morpholino that targets zinc fingers and we inject this into fertilized embryos um, along with a scramble control that um, shouldn't target anything. And we ask, when we knock down the expression of zinc fingers, what do we see happening to transposable elements? If they are indeed repressing them, then we ought to see that knocking down zinc finger expression increases transposable element expression. And so we collect these embryos at shield stage. So this is just after this big wave of uh, zinc finger and TE activation. And sure enough, we find that when we do this, we see that there's a big increase in the expression of transposable elements on the right here. And more than that, this is really driven um, not just by any old transposable elements, but by those that are youngest in the genome and most recently active, i.e. those that are probably still jumping in zebrafish populations. Okay, so that's uh, all I've got time for today. Um, but I just wanted to give you a quick teaser of sort of where we're going next with this. And so what I've shown you today is that at least one other subfamily of these zinc fingers, um, so fin zinc fingers, are silencing transposable elements during embryogenesis. But it's kind of a little bit unsatisfying because, again, uh, these zinc fingers are just sort of one 
Um, so we've got zinc fingers from zebrafish now. So we haven't really gone any further in this uh, metazoan tree. Um, but what kind of, because we can't do these functional experiments in, in all of these species, we want to know what happens if we really look at the sequences. So we've got this fins domain on the top, but here is just a random selection of all real sequences from uh, just arbitrarily selected um, species that I chose last night. So there's octopus and some insects and so on. And while these sequences are all completely unalignable, the one thing that they do all have in common are these little repressive motifs. And so uh, we're working now on trying to show exactly what these motifs are doing and whether this is a sort of universal pattern across all uh, metazoan and zinc fingers. And uh, with that, I'll say thanks to everyone in the lab, um, especially Sylvia, who helped with the functional experiments, uh, and Caitlin, who did some of the kind of early pilot work on this project. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Uh, very clear, very interesting talk. Uh, and as I say to the audience, please do go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box. And perhaps I could start by asking you, your thoughts or speculations really on um, uh, the specificity versus the generality of these uh, of these of these interactions. You know, there's, there are so many of the zinc finger uh, proteins that that might suggest that there is some specificity in their targeting, uh, uh, and that they correlate with uh, again with the transposable elements. But you would also imagine there must be a fair degree of redundancy. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, definitely. So um, there is both uh, a huge amount of redundancy amongst these in that you will often have multiple zinc fingers that target the same transposable element uh, families. Um, and as to specificity, uh, that's a similar story in that you sometimes have um, single zinc fingers that will target multiple kind of related members of um, different transposable element families. But um, yeah, these genes are, are being duplicated extremely rapidly. And so there's a lot of um, pseudogenes, certainly, but also redundant genes and so on. OK, thanks very much. So I will go over to a question from uh, it's anonymous. But um, so the question is, do you know if these uh, FINS uh, ZFPs are exclusively dedicated to silencing transposable elements or do, might they have other repressive uh, roles during uh, embryogenesis? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so certainly we're pretty sure that some of these target um, other repeats, so things like satellites, but perhaps more interestingly is that there is one big gene family um, that they target, and that is other fin zinc fingers. So both crab zinc fingers and especially these fin zinc fingers target themselves. So we think there are some interesting negative feedback loops going on there. Thanks very much. Second question, this one's from uh, James Gahan. Uh, do you have any idea if this is metazoan specific or occurring outside of uh, animals? I think this is pretty much a metazoan specific innovation. So zinc fingers are found um, throughout eukaryotes, but only metazoans have undergone this kind of um, enormous increase in the sort of complexity of sequences that they target. Okay, thanks. And uh, the last question that's on there at the moment uh, comes from, uh, no, there's one more coming up. Is This one's from uh, Olga Rospopov, and she starts off by complimenting you, Jonathan, by saying it's fantastic talk as usual. Uh, and she asks, did you try to stimulate the structure of uh, FinZZ ZFPs? If yes, does it resemble the structure in three helices observed for the crab domain. So it's the structural um, homology between these proteins. Uh, I'll go. Um, so yes, um, they don't, basically because these uh, sequences are so short, it's hard to really say that they structurally resemble one another in that they're just bits of string occasionally with an alpha helix in them. But if we look at the um, structure in combination with the uh, cofactor genes that we think they, um, bind to, then actually, yeah, there is some similarity between um, the uh, fins and crab genes, but still something that we're working on, yeah. Okay, thanks. And last question is, uh, again, complimenting very nice talk. 
Have you seen any developmental delays, uh, phenotypes when you knock down uh, the uh, fin CFPs? Yeah, so that, that's an important question um, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, the short answer is that um, no, we don't. And we were very careful to stage these. There is maybe within um, a few minutes some delay, but not enough that we're um, worried about it. And we did account for that. But we haven't looked um, at these fish if we try and raise them to adulthood yet. So. Okay, thanks again, uh, Jonathan. Uh, thanks very much.